Our next speaker is Mark Frazier. He's the president of Open World, an American nonprofit which uh, specializes in market communities, uh, market-based learning projects, uh, asset awakening policy, and policy reform. He's worked in more than 50 countries on community revitalization, technology-enabled learning, workforce development, free economic zone initiatives. Uh, basically, if we're talking about startup societies or if we're talking about special economic zones, free ports, Mark is the guy. Well, thank you, Tibal, and all here. Um, this journey, my life journey, began when I was essentially your age and in, interested in the ideas of liberty and how to bring them faster into my life and, and the lives of others. So in high school, I was publishing a magazine called Thought Magazine, basically as an excuse to get away from the classrooms independent study and through that effort I it's a long story but I became um, involved in the very early days of Reason magazine um, to get a sense how many here are libertarian or classical liberal okay so you may have heard of Reason it's um, a magazine that had absolutely no money um, at that point to uh, pay people so I became publisher of it at the age of uh, 19 and um, it had a circulation of a few hundred at that point. But the, one of the greatest rewards was going through the newsletters in the home. It was a magazine produced out of the uh, second floor room of Lanny Friedlander. And finding in, in these files stories about new country projects. A guy named Warner Stiefel and another one, Michael Oliver, both of them had fled uh, from Germany uh, before and Poland from um, the time of the, the World War, the Second World War, and became absolutely passionate about setting up free areas, free places where these atrocities could not happen again. So when they moved to the United States, they began very quietly to say what parts of the world would be open to setting up new countries, ones which respected the sovereignty of the individual. And a few years after my Reason Magazine work, I had the pleasure of meeting both of them. In fact, um, the, the experience of going, I lived in New Zealand for a year after graduating, and hearing from Mike Oliver's group that a new country was about to be born, I became very excited. I was a journalist at that point for the New Zealand Herald and uh, wrote up a story about this Declaration of Independence on the island of Espirito Santo, what then was the New Hebrides. So I went to meet Michael Oliver in Fiji and also to, uh, to go visit the site of the Nakuri Mel Federation, this newly self-declared country only to find um, that it was not all that uh, one could hope for. And the, seeing firsthand how artfully the proclaimed advocates of liberty uh, that were making this new country were able to receive money and actually not um, come through in the end with a free country, I began to rethink my enthusiasm for you know free countries being done that way. And on the way back from um, the New Hebrides, I, I rooted through Fiji, um, and by happenstance, I was taught, thinking to myself, what could be done differently to make free societies happen? And it struck me, a friend of mine at Harvard had been um, telling me about the potential for commercial launch sites to be set up. This is in the early 1970s, these conversations. So as I made my way back from New Zealand to the United States, it struck me that maybe what we could do, instead of trying to work underneath or around the existing governments, would be to create a project that was so appealing, that had such prestige, that the governments actually would want to create free societies 
to make it happen. So arriving back, I became managing editor at that point of Reason Magazine in California. Um, I talked to Bob Poole, one of the um, co-founders of, of Reason in, in its California stage, and said, Bob, why don't we try to put a free port, a competition, to create a free port of at least 200 square, square kilometers and do it in a way that whichever country removes taxes, regulations, tariffs, at least as well as Hong Kong, becomes the site for the first commercial launch operations um, in the world. We called it the Earthport Project. Arthur C. Clarke helped fund it. Robert uh, Heinlein, another famous uh, writer of science fiction, also was on board, Buckminster Fuller. So we had a very prestigious group, next to no money, but enough money to produce a brochure describing it and send it out to 40 countries near the equator. This, the equator gets you into orbit more, more quickly, so we, we defined the equator generously, but um, we're able to get back in response 12 countries saying, we want to do this. They proceeded, at least with Liberia, to designate an area, agreed to remove the taxes and the red tape, and went to the United Nations to say, here is a space launch site for the whole planet. Unfortunately, the State Department had other ideas, <coughs> and um, the export controls of satellite technology uh, were, were not going to get cleared. I learned this after two and a half years of trying. So by the late 1970s, it was clear that this idea of creating a competition and having countries compete to offer land and policy change, that part worked. But what didn't was the notion that we could get the uh, satellite launch uh, companies uh, to get clearance from the technology export uh, controls. So I, I, at that point, had um, a turning in my career. Um, by then I was 30, and feeling that's really cool to see a global response to the idea. But doing a bootstrap and doing it um, with, with a kind of big prize in that form wasn't going to work. So now I'll, I'll switch over to actually what can and, and has worked as a strategy. And you're fortunate because when I was starting out, the internet and the digital tools uh, weren't there. So now, hopefully, um, some of these experiences and approaches will be useful for the future. So the subject um, that I'll zoom through, probably do 10, 15 minutes and then questions if, uh, if, if people would like, is to take a look at three levels. This is the one we know, the one that causes the, the, the pain in people's lives through uh, tr transgressions. This is the new one, the virtual realm, and this is the informal economy. And libertarians often get um, disheartened by all of the setbacks in this layer. But the background to keep in mind is that this layer is largely free. It's a venue for people worldwide to associate and, and do things. This layer is largely free too. The informal economy, by many estimates, is about 50% of, of the world economy. So the strategy that we're going to explore is how do we take the resources in the virtual realm, largely free realm, and the informal economy, the energies there, and break through to set up areas, more and more areas of freedom <coughs> in this realm right here. So I'll, I'll zoom through this because it's um, very familiar to most people. Uh, we've got massive poverty. We've got a ripoff industry of uh, one to two trillion um, UN estimates every year. Uh, being raked off, We're, we have systems of helping 
the political um, realm, um, quote unquote, helping by delivering subsidies, and they have the effect of propping up predatory regimes. And at the same time, because of the lack of trust and, and the levels of corruption and capture in the governments, there's an estimated nine to 14 trillion dollars of what's called sleeping capital or dead capital. And this is land that's at a fraction of its value because of the failure of today's institution of governance, institutions of governance. So what do we do to change it? What the Phoenicians did back 3,000 years ago, they were going through these wars, the Egyptians and Hittites were struggling um, in a way kind of similar to today. And the region, the Eastern Mediterranean was pretty exhausted. But some merchants came up with a, a strategy. What they did, they decided instead of getting sucked into these, uh, these no-win military things, um, let's start leaving gifts on a beach. And it was really cool. Starting off right here, they began to visit villages that they had no connection to. And they would park offshore at night, row in, and leave something, a gift, on the beach, and then go back to their boat. The next morning, the villagers would wake up and see the ship and discover um, you know, the present. And at that point, one of two things would happen. Often, the village would take the gift and leave nothing. But in some cases, the villagers would say, you know, that's really kind of neat to have that present there. Let's reciprocate. And they put a gift in turn for the Phoenicians. And that began a process of creating trust across cultures and creating invitations by these villages, these host communities, to set up free zones, free trade areas. So by the over the course of uh, about 800, 900 years, the Phoenicians were able to set up trade outposts all across the Mediterranean and go trading even further beyond. So this notion of um, reciprocity, of leading with a gift, is something that created an enduring um, network of trade. Well, today, in the virtual realm, we have the opportunity to use the internet links to leave gifts on a beach, ones that can reach essentially any um, area of the world that's racked by conflict or struggling with poverty. And so as the internet reaches the vast majority of the world, we can begin taking the virtual resources and bringing them into people's lives through the cell phones and the Wi-Fi uh, centers that, that they're able to access. And through this, we'll be able to make some change. So in the virtual realm, we've got three key um, kinds of goodies. There, there's the digital gift giving themselves uh, that is one thing that we can do. There are also opportunities to make micro-investments and micro-lending. And there are also opportunities to get jobs. So the digital giving is um, taking the form of people who are doing on online volunteering, uh, offering free courses, and giving little micro-scholarships and micro-stipends to help people around the world. Microfunding, um, there increasingly is the ability to get investment uh, through various portals. And one of the things that very few people uh, yet have, have awakened to is the presence of over 50 online markets that are offering immediate work, albeit very small in terms of compensation. But if you go to websites like Fiverr.com, or freelancer.com, and dozens of others, 
Every day, there are over 100,000 little freelance projects up there. And this is not just, um, these are not projects necessarily with high-end skills. They can be things like doing web searches or taking photographs and putting captions on the photos, the digital photos. They can be secretarial uh, work. They can be people tutoring or mentoring. Um, for example, if people want to learn another language, you can get that done through these freelance markets, translators as well. And one of the, um, the areas that might be most interesting to struggling regions, um, which have low literacy and low uh, international skill and in language, is security cameras monitoring uh, these, becoming virtual guardians. So if a golf course in the Midwest, the US, you know, is wanting to save money, it's possible to feed, you know, kind of randomized ways, the images of what's coming across. And then the person at the other end, if they see something happening, press this button. So we're, we're in a world now where Billions of dollars every year are being offered in these online markets, and their barriers for micro-entrepreneurs to enter the, these markets are almost nil, as Derek was saying. You can get into the game with essentially no money. Freelancer.com has got 20 million, 21 million almost, uh, freelancers today. So. That's one area. In the informal economy, in the, the grassroots layer, we're seeing innovation as well. Uh, Peer-driven businesses, the peer-to-peer -peer lending circles, entrepreneurial schools for the poor, and increasingly entrepreneurial uh, internet centers and market-driven cell phone companies. So the peer-to-peer -peer businesses, very famous, the Grameen example. Um, Another one is the entrepreneurial schools. There was a Templeton Foundation study that with the IFC found at least 1.5 million entrepreneurial schools in poor areas. These are parents usually set up by parents who are fed up with the failure of their public schools. And in the slums of, um, of Bombay, you can, you can find the, the schools in Kenya, Nigeria, China. So this is happening now, but it's happening often in very, uh, very straightened circumstances. People have very low budgets to work with. The cell phones and internet links are, are becoming um, more and more capable too. In your pocket, you can have e-government apps now to navigate bureaucracy in some, some cases. You can also make land registry to wake up the value of the trillions of dollars of dormant capital in real estate. The reason that's locked up largely is because of the failures of registry systems, land titling and registry systems. But with cell phones that have, have cameras, it's possible to, with your neighbors, walk around record, okay, we agree, this is the line, and to have geotags that position it, and video recordings along with, so that you can have at neighborhood level, people go on record, say, we recognize this boundary, that it belongs here to this person, there to that person, and do this in a way that creates a private land registry that can include arbitration agreements too. Video re recorded, and up it goes to the blockchain. So we've got in people's pockets now, four billion you know, phones worldwide at least, and many of them with the capabilities to, to do this kind of thing. So the, that brings us to the third realm, the middle layer of the sandwich, which is the politicized realm. And what do we do there? You know, we've seen what, what uh, gatekeepers, uh, political gatekeepers can do in terms of ripping people off. 
Well, there are, there are solutions, innovations now, to break the grip of, of these gatekeepers. And they come in three, you know, three forms. Um, and these can be adopted in autocratic systems or in democratic systems to remove the, the predation of government. The first is flex wage. And this originated with Lee Kuan Yew in the 1980s, back um, in the early days of Singapore. It wasn't famous as a place for streamlined government efficient processes. So what did he, he do? He in, introduced a reform that said, everybody in the civil service, frontline people, all the way to the cabinet and the prime minister, would get a bonus each year that was indexed to the growth rate of the Singapore economy. And lo and behold, you know, the kind of uh, dusty uh, bureaucratic um, habits began very quickly to change. The culture of the bureaucracy changed because people's bottom line hinged on how much business could be made welcome. And Singapore and Hong Kong vie for that um, uh, title of, of being the freest eco economically free areas of the world. In the case of Singapore, that made a huge change. Another thing, an innovation that Singapore and Hong Kong have implemented, and Korea very much so as well, um, is e-government, where you get the graft opportunities out of the system by having clear automatic processes. If you want to register something, get a permit, boom, you do it online, and in Singapore's case, within minutes, um, other cases, sometimes a day or two, you can have at local and national level the transparency that the businesses need. The big companies are fine, pretty much, with um, a complicated business climate because they, they always have the uh, professionals and allies to navigate and lobby and buy their way through the mess. But the startup entrepreneurs, the mid-sized entrepreneurs, are the ones who need this oxygen of transparency. And e-government is a way to ensure that it's there. And the subject dear to, I think, all of our hearts, the third way to break the grip of these predatory institutions is to set up experimental areas of reform. And the Phoenicians came up with it first, 3,000 plus years ago, set up areas that are designated geographically for different policies, special economic zones, where the taxes are lifted, the red tape and uncertainty of approvals is lifted, and you have people able to do good business um, in an environment that um, lets, lets entrepreneurs flourish. So today, um, one important change quite recently, about two decades ago, Uruguay introduced a innovation in free zone statutes. It's one sentence. It says, within the zone, no commercial government monopoly shall apply. And that, in a, a single sentence, made a huge difference. A cow pasture in Montevideo, uh, early name was Montevideo Free Zone, today it's called Zone America. When I went there, they um, were aware of the value of this demonopolization, but what they did with it was turn that land into the most valuable real estate in South America. Today, no taxes in perpetuity, no customs duties on anything that's re-exported, privately administered customs under audit, from the ministry, a liberal visa policy where a thousand workers from India have come in to do software development there, world-class Asian, European, North American companies are based there because it's got this demonopolized demonopolis status. Now, the next thing to look at is land value. As I mentioned, the land in um, Uruguay has shot up um, you know, 10, 20, 30 fold over the, the original piece of, um, of farmland. 
And this kind of pattern happens. The better you get the business climate in these free zones, the less corruption, you know, the easier it is to, to invest and be entrepreneurial, the more people will pay in, in rent. And this is the, another reason that Singapore and Hong Kong have done singularly well in maintaining the world's freest climates. It's because, in the case of Hong Kong, the government owns all the land, 99.6% of the land. In the case of Singapore, the public sector owns 80% of the land. What this means is they, as people who want to lease that land out at maximum value, they have to be attuned, they have to be sensitive to what the global market is looking for in the way of a business climate. In the case of Hong Kong, uh, this is from a, um, a study that was done about 10 years ago, $70 billion over a 30-year period has been reaped from auctions and tenders of leased land. So it's real money. And because it's such a good business uh, proposition, the folks that have established uh, world names for transparent business climates are now partnering. They're entering into partnerships. In Singapore's case, uh, Lee Kuan Yew's stated aim was to create 12 little Singapores around the world by partnering with countries that have dysfunctional and broken systems and creating islands of transparency. China is all over Africa, as I think one of the speakers mentioned, also looking to partner, to create, to replicate the special economic zone success. Zone America, the Uruguayan company, has been <laughs> fielding offers for many countries to do what it, it did in Montevideo, and uh, recently has opened in Colombia, uh, a similar technology-oriented free zone. So how can we bring all of these innovations together, the virtual ones, the ones that help the informal economy, and the ones that help the political layer reform? And the answer is to use this. With cell phones, we can start offering packages, digital, you know, seed, packs, basically, for people around the world to understand and appreciate what's worked in these other countries and begin to apply it in their own life and start waking up the dormant assets. And on a you know, fingernail-sized uh, chip, uh, you can get actually now hundreds of hours of video how-to that are showing what people did to set up their own arbitration systems, their own land registry systems, their own systems of attracting external funds through crowdfunding, you know, how they um, developed e-government systems. So the stories of, of market-based successes now can be put on the size of a fingernail and be accessible to people anywhere in the world. So these are the seeds of change. They can also introduce, in, in these toolkits, they can introduce people not only to the case studies or examples that relate to them, but it, they can introduce policy uh, reform folks worldwide, no longer rely on the development agencies and the you know, experts, you know, carrying briefcases, but rather have the um, volunteers that would like to help them in free market campuses, the universities, and policy reform institutes, or in communities that have made the reform themselves, offering to, to share what they know. So through this, the people can be introduced to peers who can help them. They can also be introduced to micro projects. For example, this conference and the talks we're seeing here and hearing. Um, if Thibault, you want to go and uh, take the audio 
and offered the transcription opportunities through Fiverr.com, you'll find hundreds of people ready for five US dollars or five euro, even better for them, uh, to do the transcriptions. For talks that may have been given uh, spontaneously, you can send those. And I've done this. Um, and send those audios to people who would be delighted to create PowerPoint summaries of the, key, the highlights. In Sri Lanka, in an entrepreneurial school in a, a war-torn village, um, we took the, these, these things and um, sent them to, to students at an entrepreneurial school. And they came back with flash animations, with, with PowerPoint presentations, uh, with translations to, as an example. So by the hundreds, by the thousands, by the tens of thousands, the free market movement can be creating these micro gigs, these starter projects, and offering a, uh, a way for people to move forward. So the key, um, one of the, the frustrations of being in this digital era is everything is kind of, you know, there's so many options, so many choices. In order to get people's attention, a bundle of transforming things can be offered. So these Seeds of Change toolkits can pack in across the board assistance in how you can reform, how you can make a bootstrap um, your, your own life and also uh, that of your friends and your community. So the idea is that some part of this package goes automatically, free of charge, to everybody who wants, wants to access it, downloaded. And for the people who start making pressure and inroads, showing they understand the opportunities and also leaning on their local authorities to, to make changes, these challenge offers can now flow in greater greater number consistent so what has evolved for me is one of the uh, heartfelt um, um, you know, recommendations as you uh, hopefully uh, decide to take on the um, the free free market cause and making it actual is to start small in this case with the uh, quick start this can be a single building. In some settings, the free zones are an existing building that gets the demonopolization of telecommunications, relief from the constraints. And that can begin within months. If a government is serious, they, they can you know, make it real. You get the quick start area being a place that shows the deep pocket risk-taking private investors. This isn't talk, this is real. And as soon as you've got that example in the small form, you, what you've done is woken up the value of the land in a large expansion, a larger expansion area, to the point where it can attract the deep pocket investors and have them pay a, you know, pay up front. Uh, to have the development opportunity. And then even more, if a, a country is very serious about change, is to set aside an area for potentially a new Hong Kong, a new Singapore, a, what we call a world city. So I'm sorry I've gone on longer than I thought, but um, this is a, a phased approach. And if it's combined with a global free market group, network, consortium, saying we will leave gifts on the beach to start you getting familiar with this, and then we will be with you as you scale up, as you go further, making immediate benefits for the community in the way of the micro vouchers for access to online health uh, resources, the education opportunities, the job creation opportunities through these markets. We can layer the value of these gifts on a beach to 
their reciprocation in the form of policy change and, and uh, real estate um, commitment. So the, the, this is where we are now. Thank you.